وہ استعمال کرنا چاہیے کریشن کا لفظ استعمال کرنا چاہیے مخلوق کا لفظ استعمال کرنا چاہیے جب ہم مخلوق کی بات کریں گے تو ہم خالق کی طرف جائیں گے جب ہم خلقت کی بات کریں گے تو ہم اس کائنات کو وجود عطا کرنے والے کی طرف جائیں گے اور جب ہم اس کے وجود کو عطا کرنے والے کی طرف جائیں گے تو پھر ہم جو ہے وہ آخرت کی طرف بھی ہم متوجہ ہوں گے تو یہ بات ہم نے کی اور میں تھوڑا سا اس کے اوپر مزید اس کو ایلیبریٹ کرنا چاہتا تھا ہم نے کل ساتھ یہ بھی اس کے اوپر بھی ہم نے بات کی کہ قرآن مجید جب یہ کہتا ہے کہ تم اس کائنات پر غور و فکر کرو تو یہاں پر ایک تو اللہ تعالیٰ کہتا ہے میں نے حق سے ٹروتھ کی بنیاد پر یہ کائنات بنی ہے یعنی یہ پرپز لیس نہیں ہے اس کا ایک مقصد ہے دوسری چیز یہ ہے کہ ہم اللہ تعالیٰ کے وجود کو اس کائنات پر غور و فکر کے ذریعے سے سمجھنے کی کوشش کریں اور اللہ تعالیٰ کی معرفت اور اللہ تعالیٰ کی شناخت جو ہے وہ حاصل کرنا ہمارے لیے بہت ضروری ہے تو معرفت پروردگار جو ہے وہ پہلا قدم ہے اپنی صحیح دینداری کی طرف جب ہم آگے بڑھتے ہیں جب امام صادق علیہ السلام سے کسی نے پوچھا کہ مولا ہماری دعائیں قبول کیوں نہیں ہوتی تو آپ نے ایک بڑا عجیب جواب دیا آپ نے کہا کہ اس لیے کہ ہم جس سے مانتے ہیں مانگتے ہیں جس سے ہم اس کو ہم جانتے نہیں اس کو ہم پہچانتے نہیں ہیں اب آپ اس سے مانگ رہے ہیں جس کو آپ پہچانتے ہی نہیں ہیں جس کی آپ کو معرفت ہی نہیں ہے تو آپ کی دعا قبول کیسے ہوگی یہ بڑی اس کے اندر ڈیپت ہے اب میں دعا کی قبولیت کی طرف نہیں جانا چاہتا تو ہم نے بات کی کہ اسی کائنات پر غور و فکر کرنے سے ہمیں یہ بھی پتہ چلتا ہے کہ یہ کائنات کل و شعین حالق ہر چیز جو ہے وہ وینش اور تباہ اور فنا ہو جانے والی ہے جب فنا کا ذکر آتا ہے تو اس سے ہم آخرت کی طرف منتقل ہوتے ہیں تو اسی آیت کے اندر کئی مختلف ایسپیکٹس ہیں جس کی طرف اشارہ کیا جا رہا ہے حق کی بات کی جا رہی ہے تاکہ ہم اس کے پرپس فل ہونے کو ہم سمجھ سکیں یہ بے مقصد اس کو خلق نہیں کیا گیا اللہ تعالیٰ کے وجود کو سمجھنے کی کوشش کریں اللہ تعالیٰ کی معرفت حاصل کرنے کی کوشش کریں اور معاد قیامت ڈے آف ریزورکشن جو ہے وہ بھی ہم اس کے ذریعے سے ہم ثابت کرنے کی کوشش کریں تو یہ ایک چیز جس کی طرف ہم نے اشارہ کیا برہان نظم جو آرڈر آرگیومنٹ فرام ڈیزائن اس کے اوپر ہم نے تھوڑی سی بات کی کہ اللہ تعالیٰ نے اس کائنات کو ایسا بنایا ہے جب اس کائنات کو دیکھتے ہیں اس سسٹم کو دیکھتے ہیں اس اسٹرکچر کو دیکھتے ہیں اس کریشن کو دیکھتے ہیں تو اس کے ذریعے سے ہمیں یہ پتہ چلتا ہے کہ ہم اس کو کسی مقصد کے لیے بنایا گیا ہے اور کل ہم نے اشارہ کیا کہ جتنا اگر آپ اوریجنیٹر اور آخرت دونوں کو ملا کے اس کائنات کو دیکھیں گے تو جتنے زیادہ آپ اسپیشلائزیشن کی طرف جائیں گے جتنا آپ ان ڈیپتھ آپ ریسرچ کریں گے آپ سائنس سے اگر وابستہ ہیں میڈیکل سائنس سے تو ایک آئی اسپیشلسٹ جو ہے وہ جتنا بہتر خدا کے وجود کو ثابت کر سکتا ہے اس برہان نظم کے ذریعے سے کہ جب وہ ایک انسانی آنکھ میں موجود جو بہت کمپلیکسٹی ہے اس کے اندر اور اتنی پیچیدگیوں کو دیکھ کر وہ یہ اندازہ لگاتا ہے کہ یہ چیزیں خود بخود وجود میں آنے والی نہیں ہیں بلکہ اس کے پیچھے ایک انٹیلیجنٹ ڈیزائنر موجود ہے کہ جو انسانی آنکھ آخری شکل اس کی سامنے آتی ہے لیکن اس کے پیچھے جو ہے کتنے میڈیکلی اگر ہم دیکھیں تو اس میں پیچیدگیاں موجود ہیں کتنی چیزیں موجود ہیں تو ایک میڈیکل ڈاکٹر جتنا اچھا خدا کو پہچان سکتا ہے وہ میں اور آپ نہیں پہچان سکتے تو اس لحاظ سے لیکن پریکٹیکلی ایسا نہیں ہوتا آپ دیکھیں ہزاروں لاکھوں دنیا میں ڈاکٹرز ہیں لیکن وہ خدا کے منکر بھی ہیں اس لیے کہ انہوں نے کائنات کو طبیعت کے طور پر دیکھا ہے نیچر کے طور پر دیکھا ہے خلقت کے طور پر نہیں دیکھا مخلوق کے طور پر نہیں دیکھا تو جب تک آپ اوور آل اپنی ورلڈ ویو کو ٹھیک نہیں کرتے آپ چیزوں سے استفادہ نہیں کر سکتے تو ایک مقام پر آیت اللہ متحری ایک بڑی خوبصورت بات کرتے ہیں وہ کہتے ہیں جو میتھمیٹکس ہے میتھمیٹکس بھی اس میں آتا ہے اور فلاسفی کی جو بات کرتے ہیں جو وہ کہتے ہیں کہ فلاسفی جو ہے وہ مشکل نہیں ہوتی 
مشکل اس لیے لگتی ہے کہ ہم اس کو جس نگاہ سے ہم دیکھتے ہیں ہماری اپروچ غلط ہوتی ہے اگر ہماری اپروچ ٹھیک ہو مثلا وہ مثال بڑی خوبصورت دیتے ہیں مثلا ہم خدا کو پہچاننا چاہتے ہیں اب میں کہتا ہوں کہ اچھا خدا کو کیسے میں سمجھنے کی کوشش کروں اچھا میں کہوں گا میرے سامنے مائکرو فون ہے میرے سامنے کار کی ہے میرے سامنے سیل فون ہے میرے سامنے ایک بک ہے میرے سامنے پیپرز پڑے ہوئے ہیں اچھا اتنی چیزیں پڑھی ہیں اور ٹیبل پڑھی ہے خدا بھی ان میں سے کوئی ایک پانچویں چھٹی چیز ہوگا تو جب آپ اس طرح سے خدا کو ڈھونڈنے کی کوشش کریں گے تو آپ کبھی خدا کو تلاش نہیں کر سکتے کیونکہ آپ نے شروع سے ہی چیزوں کو غلط پرسپیکٹو میں دیکھنا شروع کیا لیکن وہ ایگزامپل اپنی چینج کرتے ہیں وہ ایگزامپل کہتے ہیں کہ آپ کے سامنے ٹائم اینڈ اسپیس کے ایگزامپل نے ابھی جو ٹائم ہے وقت جس کو کہتے ہیں زمان جس کو کہتے ہیں یا مکان جس کو کہتے ہیں اسپیس وہ آپ کی ایک فورتھ ڈائمینشن ہے آپ کی ایک ففتھ ڈائمینشن ہے آپ کی آپ اس طرح سے اگر دیکھیں گے تو پھر آپ خدا کو بہتر طور پر آپ سمجھنے کے قابل ہوں برہان ہدایت کی طرف ہم نے شروع کیا اور آج بھی ہمارے پاس چونکہ لیٹ شروع کیا ہم نے تو برہان ہدایت جو ہے وہ بھی ایک بالکل قرآن مجید ہمیں نیا پرسپیکٹو دیتا ہے کہ اس کائنات میں یہ آرگیومنٹ آف گائیڈنس جو ہے اس کو سمجھنے کی ضرورت ہے دیکھیں برہان نظم جو ہے آرگیومنٹ آف ڈیزائن جو ہے جس میں ہم کہتے ہیں کہ انٹیلیجنٹ ڈیزائنر ہے اس کا تعلق جو ہے وہ اسٹرکچر سے ہے اس کریشن سے ہے اس نظام سے ہے اس نظام کو آپ دیکھیں گے فوراً سمجھ جائیں گے کہ اس کو کس پرپس کے لیے بنایا گیا آپ اس سیل فون کو دیکھتے ہی سمجھ جائیں گے کہ اس کو کس لیے بنایا گیا یہ کتاب آپ کے سامنے ہے آپ اس کتاب کو کھولیں گے آپ ایک بچہ اگر دیکھے گا تو وہ کہے گا کہ اس میں کوئی آرڈر نہیں ہے کوئی نظم نہیں ہے اس کو سمجھ نہیں آئے گی لیکن آپ اس کتاب کو دیکھتے ہی سمجھ جائیں گے کہ اس کے پیچھے لکھنے والے کا ایک مقصد تھا آپ اس کو ایسے پرپز لیس قرار نہیں دے سکتے تو برہان نظم میں اس طریقے سے ہم دیکھتے ہیں لیکن جس میں کمپلیکس فنکشنیلٹی جو ہے وہ بڑی امپورٹنٹ ہے لیکن برہان ہدایت میں جو ہے جو بہت امپورٹنٹ چیز ہے اس کا تعلق سسٹم سے نہیں ہے بلکہ یہ سسٹم ورک کیسے کرتا ہے اس سے ہے یعنی یہ کس طرح سے کام کرتا ہے سسٹم دو چیزیں بالکل الگ الگ ایک نظام کو آپ نے دیکھا اس کو دیکھتے ہی آپ نے کہا کہ اس کے پیچھے ایک پرپز ہے لیکن اس کے جو اس سسٹم کے جو دوسرے آرگنز ہیں وہ کیسے ورک کرتے ہیں یہ اللہ تعالیٰ نے الگ اس نظام کے اندر رکھا ہے جس کو جب حضرت موسا نے کہا کہ موسا فرعون کے جواب میں من ربو کا یا موسا کہا رب الزی آتا کل شعین خلقہ ہو خلقت عطا کی کریشن عطا کی یہ الگ ہے سما ہدا اور پھر سما کا مطلب ہے ایک فاصلہ ڈسٹینس آ گیا کہ دو الگ الگ چیزیں ہیں پہلے اللہ تعالیٰ نے اس کو خل کیا پھر اس کو پروپورشن دیا پھر اس کو اللہ تعالیٰ نے جو ہے وہ اور تیسرے مرحلے پر ہدایت کی بات کی کہ میں نے اس کو گائیڈنس دی ہے کیا مطلب میں نے جو چیز اس کائنات میں بنائی ہے چاہے وہ نان لیونگ بینگ ہو چاہے وہ پلانٹس ہوں چاہے وہ اینیملز ہوں چاہے وہ انسان ہوں ان میں ہر ایک میں اپنی استعداد اپنی کیپیسٹی اپنی پوٹینشل کے مطابق ہر ایک اپنی پرفیکشن تک جائے گا یعنی یا پرفیکشن تک جائے گا یا میں نے اس کو راستہ بتایا ہے کہ تم نے کہاں تک جانا ہے اور فرض کرتے ہیں کہ ایپل ٹری سیب کا درخت ہے اب سیب کا درخت جو ہے اس کی آپ اندازہ لگا سکتے ہیں کہ اس کی فائنل الٹیمیٹ پرفیکشن کیا ہے اس نے کہاں تک جانا ہے اسی طرح اللہ تعالیٰ کہتا ہے میں نے کائنات کے ذرے ذرے کو میں نے بتایا اس کی اپنی قابلیت کے اعتبار سے آسنا کل شعین کی بات کیا ہے کہ اس سے بہتر نظام نہیں ہو سکتا آسنا سپر لیٹو ڈگری ہے اللہ تعالیٰ کہتا ہے یہ جو کچھ بھی ہے آپ یہ نہیں کہہ سکتے کہ اس سے بہتر کوئی چیز وجود میں آ سکتی تھی اس سے بہتر نہیں جو جس کا ڈیزرو کرتا ہے جتنا میں نے اس کے مطابق اس کو پیدا کیا ہے اور جہاں تک وہ جا سکتا ہے میں نے اس کو وہ ٹولز دیے ہیں میں نے اس کو وہ پاورز دی ہیں میں نے اس کو وہ پوٹینشلز دی ہیں اور 
پھر اس کے مطابق اس کو استفادہ کرنے کا طریقہ بتایا ہے کہ وہ کس طرح سے ان سے استفادہ کرے گا تو وہ جو ہے اپنی منزل تک جو ہے وہ پہنچ سکتا ہے تو اب آپ دیکھیں کہ کچھ ایگزامپلز ہیں جو میں بتانا چاہتا ہوں جو اگر ہم نان لیونگ بینگ میں دیکھیں تو یہ تھوڑا سا مشکل ہے اس کو ثابت کرنا مثلا ہم کہتے ہیں کہ زمین جو ہے وہ سورج کے گرد گھومتی ہے اب ہمارے سائنٹسٹ ہیں نیوٹن ہیں انہوں نے انہوں نے جب یہ سمجھا کہ ایک گریوٹی ارتھ گریوٹی جو ہے اس کائنات میں موجود ہے ان کو سمجھ نہیں آ رہی تھی اس وقت اس کا نام کیا رکھا جائے انہوں نے کہا کہ فی الحال ہم اس کا نام جو ہے وہ کشیش ثقل جس کو ہم کہتے ہیں گریوٹی رکھ دیتے ہیں اس کو تو یہ گریوٹی کا جو اصول ہے اس کی بنیاد پر پوری کائنات قائم ہے تو یہ کہتے ہیں ہمارے حکما کہ اللہ تعالیٰ نے جو ہے بنیادی طور پر اندر سے ایک ایک ہڈن اور ایک مسٹیریس پاور ہے جو ہدایت کرتی ہے ہر چیز کو کہ اس نے کہاں تک جانا ہے اور اس کی پرفیکشن کیا ہے جب ایک سیڈ کو بیچ کو جب آپ زمین میں پلانٹ کرتے ہیں کلٹیویٹ کرتے ہیں تو اس بیچ میں جو پوٹینشیل ہے وہ گاڑی کی طرح نہیں ہے جو میں نے کل مثال دی تھی کہ آپ نے ایک کار کو بنایا اور آپ نے اس کے سسٹم میں ہے کہ آپ نے بریک لگائی آپ نے ایکسیلریٹر دیا آپ نے چابی سے اسٹارٹ کیا اس کو تو اس میں کوئی الگ سے نہیں ہے جو بنا دیا اسی کا حصہ ہے وہ لیکن یہاں ایسا نہیں ہے اللہ تعالیٰ کہتا ہے کہ اس بیچ کی میں مستقل ایک رہنمائی کر رہا ہوں میں اس کو اندر سے گائڈ کر رہا ہوں کہ اس نے کہاں جانا ہے اور کس حد تک اس نے جانا ہے اور میں نے اس کے ساتھ پورا انوائرمنٹ اور سب چیزیں جو ہیں وہ اس کے ساتھ میں نے اس کا انتظام رکھا ہے اسی طرح حیوانات کے اندر جو ہے وہ اللہ تعالیٰ کہتے ہیں میں نے انسٹنکٹ جو رکھی ہے یہ جو جس کو ہم طبیعت کہتے ہیں یا اس کو ہم غریضہ کہتے ہیں عربک میں یا ہم اس کو فارسی اردو میں جبلت کہتے ہیں لیکن یہ انسٹنکٹ جو ہے حیوانات کے اندر پائی جاتی ہے یہ بھی اصول ہدایت کے مطابق ہے مثلا ایک بچہ بطخ کا اس کو شروع سے ہی پتا ہوتا ہے کہ وہ سوئم کر سکتا ہے اس کے اندر ایک ہدایت موجود ہے تو یہ اس طرح کی مثال دی گئی ہے ہنی بی وہ سالہ سال سے آپ دیکھیں کہ اللہ تعالیٰ کہتا ہے کہ باؤ ہر ابو کا النہ کہ ہم نے اس کو وہی بھیجی یہ جو اللہ تعالیٰ کہتا ہے ہم نے وہی بھیجی شہد کی مکھی کو یہ بڑی امپورٹنٹ بات ہے یہ صرف یہ نہیں ہے کہ ایک آٹومیٹک سسٹم ہے کہ جس کے تحت جو ہے اس کے وہ یہ ورک کر رہی ہے اور اس کے ذریعے سے وہ جو ہے وہ ہنی بنا رہی ہے وہ ایسا نہیں ہے بلکہ اللہ تعالیٰ مستقل اس کو ایک ہدایت دے رہا ہے کہ اس نے کس طرف جانا ہے اس کی پرفیکشن کیا ہے ہم نے اس سے کیا کام لینا ہے اسی طرح انسان کے اندر جو ہے یہ جو الہامات ہوتے ہیں اخلاقی الہامات جس کو ہم کانشیس کہتے ہیں ضمیر کہتے ہیں کہ انسان میں سیلف اکیوزیشن اکیوزنگ نفس جو ہوتا ہے کہ جو انسان کو اکیوز کرتا ہے انسان کا بھی اگر آپ کوئی غلط کام کرتے ہیں تو نفس لوامہ جس کو کہتے ہیں سیلف اکیوزنگ سول تو یہ آپ کو اندر سے آپ کو بتاتی ہے کہ آپ نے غلط کام کیا ہے اور ایک آواز آپ کو آتی ہے کہ انسان جو ہے وہ گناہ کر رہا ہے معصیت کر رہا ہے کسی پہ ظلم کر رہا ہے لیکن ایک وقت آتا ہے یہ آواز آنا بند ہو جاتی ہے قرآن یہ کہتا ہے کہ جب تک آپ اس کو سنتے ہیں جب تک یہ آپ کی مدد کرتی ہے لیکن اگر آپ اس کو سننا چھوڑ دیتے ہیں تو یہ آواز نہیں آتی پھر آواز آنا کم ہوتی چلی آتی ہے ایک وقت آتا ہے جو ظالم ہیں چور ہیں ڈاکو ہیں جو مجرم ہیں کرمنلز ہیں ان کو آواز نہیں آتی لیکن دوسرے جو مومنین ہیں ان کو آواز آتی ہے کس کی اس تو یہ ایک امپورٹنٹ بات ہے اور اسی طرح سے دوسری مثالیں ہیں اس کی کہ برہان ہدایت جو ہے ہمارے لیے بہت امپورٹنٹ ہے کہ ہم اس کو دیکھیں کہ اس کائنات میں برہان نظم ہے برہان فطرت ہے برہان خلقت ہے برہان ہدایت ہے یہ سارے الگ الگ چیزیں ہیں اور یہ انسان کو مدد کرتی ہیں کہ ہم اللہ تعالیٰ کو بہتر طور پر پہچان سکیں کل کی ہماری جو گفتگو ہوگی وہ آیات الہی پر ہوگی کہ سائنز آف اللہ سبحان و تعالیٰ اور اس میں جو آئینے اور مرر کی مثال ہے کہ اللہ تعالیٰ کو اور اس کائنات کے درمیان جو رابطہ ہے اس کو امام رضا علیہ السلام نے ایک مرر سے تشبیح دی ہے اور یہ بہت امپورٹنٹ ہے کہ ہم اس مسئلے کو سمجھیں کہ یہ مرر سے کیا مراد ہے 
آئینہ جو ہم اپنی زندگی میں صورت دیکھتے ہیں اپنی شکل دیکھتے ہیں اس کو تشبیح دی ہے اللہ تعالیٰ اور اس کائنات خلقت کے ساتھ ان شاء کل اس پر بات کریں گے اللہ تعالیٰ آپ سب کی توفیقات میں اضافہ کریں و صلی اللہ علیہ محمد و اللہ علیہ طیبین الطاہرین المعصومین كثير جرمي إنما كان من خطائي وعمدي أطمعني في أن أسألك ما لا أستوجبه منك الذي رزقتني من رحمتك وعريتني من قدرتك وأرفتني من إجابتك فسرت أدعوك آمنا وأسألك مستأنسا لا خائفا ولا وجلا مدلا عليك فيما قصدت فيه إليك فإن أبت عني أتبت بجهلي عليك ولأن الذي أبت عني هو خيرا لعلمك بآقبة الأمور فلم أر مولا كريما أسفر على عبد لئيم منك علي يا ربي إنك تدعوني فأولي عنك وتتحبب إلي وتبغض إليك وتتودد إلي فلا أقبل منك كأن لي يتطول عليك فلم يمنعك ذلك من الرحمة لي وإحساني إليك واتفضلي علي بجودك وكرمك فرحم عبدك الجاهل وجد عليه بفضل إحسانك إنك جواد كريم الحمد لله مالك الملك وجر الفلك مسخر الرياح فالق الاسماء ديان الدين رب العالمين الحمد لله على حلمه بعد علمه والحمد لله على أفوه بعد قدرته والحمد لله على طول أناته في غضبه وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الرزق فارق الإسباح الجلال والإكرام والفضل والإنعام الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي ليس له مناز يعادل ولا شبيه يشاكل ولا ظهير يعادل وهر بعزته العزة وتوضع لعظمته العظمة فبلغ بقدرته ما يشاء الحمد لله الذي يجيبني حين أنادي ويستر علي كل أرة وأنا أعصي ويعذب النعمة علي فلا أجازي فكم من فكم من موحبة حنية قد أعطاني وعظيمة مخوفة قد كفاني وبحجة منقة قد أراني فأثني عليه هامدا وأذكره مسبحا الحمد لله الذي لا يحتك حجابه ولا يخلق بابه ولا يرد سائله ولا يخيب آمله الحمد لله الذي يؤمن الخائفين وينجي الصالحين ويرفع المستضعفين ويضع المستكبرين ويحلق ملوكا ويستخلف آخرين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الحاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضعي حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين 
الحمد لله الذي من خشيته ترعد السماء وسكانها وترجف الأرض وعمارها وتموج البحار ومن يسبح في غمراتها الحمد لله الذي حدانا, حدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لا يا لولا أن حدان الله الحمد لله الذي يخلق ولم يخلق ويرزق ولا يرزق ويطعم ولا يطعم ويميت الأحياء وهي الموتى وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وأمينك وصفيك وحبيبك وخيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك أفضل وأحسن وأجمل وأكمل وأسكى وأنما وأتيب وأطهر وأسنى وأكثر ما صليت وباركت وترحمت وتحننت وسلمت على أحد من عبادك وأنبيائك ورسلك وصفوتك وأهل الكرامة عليك من خلقك اللهم وسل على علي أمير المؤمنين ووسي الرسول رب العالمين عبدك ووليك وأخي رسولك وحجتك على خلقك وآيتك الكبرى والنبأ العظيم وصل على صديقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وصل على سبطي الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة وصل على أمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي ولقل في الهادي المهدي وججك 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 على عبادك وأمنائك في بلادك صلاة كثيرة دائما اللهم صل على ولي أمرك القائم المؤمل والعدل المنتظر ووفه بملائكتك المقربين وأيده بروح القدس يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعله داعيا إلى كتابك والقائم بدينك استقلفه في الأرض كما استخلفت الذين من قبلك مكن له دينك الذي لدر تذيته له أبدله من بعد خوفه أمنا يعبدك لا يشرك بك شيئا اللهم عزز عز عزه وعزز به وانصره وانتصر به وانصره نصرا عزيزا وافتح له فتحا يسيرا واجعل واجعل له منك من لدنك سلطانا نسيرا اللهم اذهر به دينك وسنه نبيك حتى لا يستخفي بشيء من الخ من الحق مخافة أحد من الخلق 
Allahumma inna narakhabu narakhabu ilayka fi dawlatin karima tu'izzu biha al-islam wa ahla wa tudhillu biha al-nifaq wa ahla wa taj'aluna fiha min al-du'at ila ta'atik wa laqadati ila sabilik وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما أرفتنا من الحلق فحملنا وما قصرنا عنه فبلغنا اللهم من به شعثنا واشعب به سدعنا وأرد تق به فتقنا وكثر به قلتنا وعزز به ذلتنا وأخن به عائلنا وقذ به أن مغرمنا وجبر به فقرنا وسد به خلتنا ويسر به عصنا وبيض به وجوحنا وفك به أسرنا وأنجز به طلبتنا وأنجز به مواعيدنا واستجب به دعوتنا وأعطنا به سؤلنا وبلغنا به من الدنيا من الدنيا والآخرة آمالنا و وأعطنا به فوق رغبتنا يا خير المسؤولين وأوسع المعطين اشف به صدورنا وأذهب به خير قلوبنا واهدنا به لما اختلف فيه من الخلق من الحق بإذنك إنك إنك تهدي من تشاء إلى سراط مستقيم وانصرنا به على عدوك وعدونا إلى حل حقي آمين اللهم إنا نشكو إليك فقد نبينا صلواتك عليه وآله وخيبة ولينا وكثرة عدونا وقلة عددنا وشدة الفتن بنا وتذاحر الزمان علينا فصل على محمد وآله وعنا على ذلك بفتح منك تعجله وبذور تكشفه ونصر تعزه وسلطان حق تظهره ورحمة منك تجللناها وعافية منك تلبسناها برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم أدخل على أهل القبور السرور اللهم أغني كل فقير اللهم أشبع كل جائع اللهم أكسو كل أريان اللهم أقضي دين كل مدين اللهم فرجا كل مكروب اللهم رد كل قريب اللهم فك كل أسير اللهم أسلح كل فاسد من أمور المسلمين اللهم اشف كل مريض اللهم سد فقرنا بغناك اللهم غير سوء أهالنا بحسن حالك اللهم اخذ عنا الدين واخذنا من الفاق إنك على كل شيء قدير
Assalamu alaikum everyone. Just a quick announcement for uh, the brothers and sisters in Atikaf. There's a small amendment to, to the Q&A tonight, inshallah. It's going to start at 9.45. So after iftar, um, we'll have some time to, to socialize um, or do, um, I guess we shouldn't be socializing. But uh, after iftar uh, at 9.45, we're going to begin the uh, Q&A. Inshallah, it's going to be an interactive session. For the brothers and the sisters, we're going to pull the partition apart so both the sisters and the brothers can see uh, Sheikh Muhammad al Halli, inshallah. Jazakumullah. Jazakumullah khaira. Or Muhammad in Wali Muhammad Salwat. Tonight's iftar has been sponsored by Bande Khuda in uh, all the Marumins in the donors family and also for Marhum Sultan Hussein Chagani and family, Marhum Roshnali Jiraj and family, and Marhum Hussein Riji and family. If we can uh, please recite Surya Fatiha for all the Marumins in the family. Bismillah. We just have a few announcements. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Brother Kashif Ahmad. He's the uh, chairman of NCCM. He will uh, come and talk about uh, what his organization does, how it supports Muslims and communities, especially where there is an issue or discrimination. So if you can uh, please recite a loud salawat for Brother Kashif Ahmad. Allah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم to all of you it's absolutely a delight to be back at the Azhar Islamic Center with the Jamaat uh, you have been a very gracious community 
every year to NCCM in hosting us. So I thank uh, the entire uh, Azara executive team, Brother Azim, um, and all of you for hosting us uh, here tonight. I won't take up too much time, inshallah, but I did want to share uh, with the Azara community some of the updates from the National Council of Canadian Muslims, NCCM. For those who don't know me, I am, uh, of course, Kash Vamid. I'm the chair of the board of directors of NCCM. Uh, we have a national board uh, across the country, uh, represented from across from Quebec all the way to BC. Um, and I have been with the uh, NCCM for a number of years. Uh, and alhamdulillah, we have some really exciting things uh, to share with you today in terms of the kind of work uh, that we have been doing. And I will be remiss to mention as well uh, that you know, we have a member of the community as well from this Jamaat, uh, Sister uh, Laya Behbani, who serves on our National uh, Advisory Council. So, so we're really, mashallah, a, a national group that unites the Ummah behind a common cause, uh, which is the fight against Islamophobia uh, and discrimination. Next slide, yes. So what's the vision at NCCM? And we thought really hard about that in the past few years. Uh, and we've, you know, we've come to realize that you know, we can do a lot of workshops, and you can do a lot of meetings, and we can do a lot of open houses at our masajid, um, and we can you know, write the occasional op-ed piece uh, talking about Islam. But fundamentally, at its core, Muslims remain unknown. Muslims remain, to some extent, disliked. The latest polling we have on Canadian opinion about Muslims shows that about 44% of Canadians favor some kind of dislike or unfavorable view towards the Muslim community. And obviously this is shaped by current events, by the news media, by the pop culture. So we have our work cut out for us. So at NCCM we decided <clears throat> that we need to set a target inshallah as a community, as organizations, so where we want to go in this fight against Islamophobia. And we said that by 2040, we want to reduce Islamophobic attitudes, that 44%, to only 10% of the population. That way, our message will be much more heard in the general Canadian public once they have a chance uh, to understand us and, and we have a chance to reduce those attitudes. So how do we do that? Next slide, please. So at a glance, NCCM's work is concentrated in four key areas. Number one is political engagement. We have a full-time national staff that deals day in, day out with lobbying elected officials at the federal, provincial, and local level. Just today, given the events in Al-Aqsa, in, in Al-Quds, the NCCM team was in close touch with the federal government. If you go on your phones at, at NCCM on your Twitter account, you'll see that we have, alhamdulillah, just today about a dozen MPs and the Minister of Foreign Affairs condemning what happened at Al-Aqsa. So this is an example of the kind of work that we do when it comes to uh, advocacy. Legal advocacy, we intervene before the courts in major cases involving discrimination and Islamophobia. Uh, the most recent one we did uh, involved, um, uh, essentially the legal question was, do religious organizations in Canada have the right to discipline and remove members and govern their own affairs? This was a question that, that we thought was relevant for the Muslim community, and NCCM intervened in that case to explain why the Muslim community would believe that our institution should be self-regulated and there should be minimal intrusion from government or the courts when it comes to internal community affairs. Um, community engagement and education, that's a core part of our work. We are in school boards across the country educating the community and children and teachers about Islamophobia to make our schools a safe space for our children. Next slide, please. So what did we do in the last year? What are some of our key impacts? Well, we mobilized over 300,000 Muslims in Canada behind our advocacy campaigns. That's on social media, that's by email, that's by attending a rally, that's by uh, joining us for uh, a phone bank where we're calling our MPs, a variety of fora that are used to mobilize the Muslim community. We reached over 2,000 elected officials, right? 
So that's federal, provincial, and municipal. That's only possible because of people like you. You know, we only have a team of about, alhamdulillah, now about 20 staff. But 20 staff aren't reaching 2,000 people, right, individually. It's from the community support through our advocacy days, our lobbying days, when members come out from the community and they help NCCM push a particular issue or campaign forward. 70 legal cases, including three cases, Supreme Court of Canada. Alhamdulillah, I'm proud to say, and not because I'm a lawyer, but Alhamdulillah, you know, we actually have three full-time staff lawyers now at NCCM. That was never the case before, Alhamdulillah. We have members of our team who are dedicated to fighting Islamophobia, representing Muslims. Just last week, we did a press conference in front of a Walmart in Waterloo, Ontario, where a Yemeni Muslim couple went through the worst experience you can imagine. A husband was accused of abusing his wife in a shopping aisle at Walmart. It didn't happen. There was no abuse. He was arrested and kept away from his baby and his wife for nine months because of one allegation by one stranger and the police, the Walmart officials, the courts, everyone thought he did it. And no one cared to ask the key question. What was that key question? No one spoke to his wife. Did it actually happen? No. She was ignored. She had no agency. She's an oppressed Muslim woman. This is the kind of issues we're dealing with, brothers and sisters. Right? And, that, and that issue really hit me at my core, because that could have been any one of us at the, at the, at the mall in Walmart, shopping with our families, and next thing you know, our lives are turned upside down. So NCCM has stood with this family, we have launched a case, we hired a lawyer for that family, and inshallah with the community support we're gonna get justice for them, and ensure that our courts do not accept these kinds of frivolous cases, right? We implored the prosecutors to drop the case, they wouldn't listen. So we have a lot of work to do as a community to protect ourselves, and our families, and our community from these kinds of injustices. So, in the last uh, year, since last Ramadan, what has NCCM done? I'm going to share with you four key achievements, just very briefly. Number one, and you can go on the next slide, please. After the London attack against the Afzal family, NCCM called for a national summit on Islamophobia. That was done, alhamdulillah, the government called that summit. And at that summit, we made over 60 recommendations about what needs to happen to combat Islamophobia in the country. One of our central asks was the government must create a special office within the machinery of government called at the special office or the, the special representative to combat Islamophobia. We lobbied hard for this. And with the support of the community coast to coast, alhamdulillah, this past January, the federal government did announce that they would, that they would create this office, that they would appoint someone to be the special envoy, and that last, just about 10 days ago, when the federal budget came out, about $5.6 million will be allocated towards this office. This is the first office of its kind in any Western jurisdiction. Alhamdulillah. Not in the US, it's not in the UK, it's nowhere. We are the first jurisdiction, alhamdulillah, to have a dedicated government office that will be looking at issues of Islamophobia. Our next uh, fight will be making sure the right person's appointed, right? Making sure it's not just some political appointee, some you know, random uh, friend of the prime minister or someone close to government, someone who's actually qualified to do this work in a meaningful way. And inshallah, inshallah we'll have a chance to share that with you as well in the coming, coming weeks. Next slide, please. You know, the Azal family was attacked by a white supremacist an 18-year-old white supremacist who was consuming neo-Nazi and anti-Muslim material online. Right? So NCCM has made it a core part of our mission to ensure that our communities are safe. We have lobbied hard for the worst violent white supremacist groups to be banned. And alhamdulillah, because of your efforts, just this past year, the three percenters, which was one of the largest white supremacist groups active in the US and in Canada, was listed as a terrorist entity by the government of Canada, alhamdulillah. That's one step closer for us being, keeping our community safe and keeping our massages safe 
from some of these groups, from, from organizing, from fundraising, from doing the worst kinds of things to support their work. This is one of many, there were several listed, but I highlight the three percenters because they are the most violent of Islamophobic groups in North America. Of course, you all know about Bill 21 in Quebec, the fight against, you know, the, the ban against the hijab in the public service. Uh, we are working night and day against that bill. We, inshallah, will be heading to the Quebec Court of Appeal on this case. This will end up, brothers and sisters, in the Supreme Court of Canada. Mark my words, this case will be heard within one to two years in the Supreme Court of Canada. It will be decided by the Supreme Court. And our hope is, inshallah, that it will be struck down. But in the meantime, we have been working with cities across the country to mobilize loudly and say no Canadian community, whether it's Vancouver, Toronto, Winnipeg, or anywhere else, no one supports this bill, no one supports this kind of law, and we will fight it tooth and nail, inshallah, until we defeat it. So thank you to all of you for your support in helping us make this a national movement against Bill 21. And last but not least, something that affects all of us, all of our masajid, all of our institutions, and that is systemic Islamophobia within the Canadian Revenue Agency Charities Branch. The CRA's Charities Branch is auditing at any given time half a dozen or more Muslim charities in the country, looking for all kinds of you know, assumptions and, 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 and stereotypes. NCCM published a report with the University of Toronto last year called um, un, uh, Layered Suspicion. Layered Suspicion. You can go to layeredsuspicion.ca. We exposed the biases against Muslim charities in that report, one of the charities in that report is a Shia Muslim charity. It was called the, uh, I believe, the Ahlul Bayt Islamic Assembly of Canada, which was unfairly targeted by CRA. And we did an in-depth report as to why those kinds of punitive actions by CRA are unfair, are unconstitutional. We're moving forward now with working hard to ensure that the Revenue Canada deals with this issue on a, on a forward basis. We've got a commitment from the National Revenue Minister to look at this issue, but we're not gonna rest until we get real answers as to why the CRA continues to target Muslim charities in Canada uh, with undue suspicion. So that will give you, uh, that's the that summation of our, of our four major wins in the past year since last Ramadan. They're only possible because of your support, the support of the Muslim community, the support of all of you, including our youth who have been so um, positive and motivated to be involved in NCCM's campaigns. I, we want more of you to join us. Uh, inshallah, our plan is to open in office in BC by the end of 2022. With your dua, with your support, that's going to happen. And we'll have a chance to make a much more uh, local impact as well here in BC. I look forward to sharing the authority tonight. Uh, and I look forward to all of you. Uh, please donate. Go to nccm.ca commit a donation to NCCM tonight or this week inshallah we look forward to your support assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh thank you brother kashif for that information i'll like i'll now like to invite uh, brother ali azhar rashid our principal for azhar madrasa Muhammad in Wali Muhammad Salawat. Awadu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Sheikh Hilly, my dear scholars, elders, brothers and sisters, salamu alaykum. <coughs> I wanted to make a special announcement. Um, I'm excited to announce that in collaboration with the Madrasa Center of Excellence of the World Federation, we will inshallah be having the renowned facilitator, facilitator Sayyid Ali Nakwi come to Vancouver and conduct the Teacher Skills Program, also known as the TSB. This training is open to all volunteers who have either in the past or currently or are aspiring, expi aspiring to be madrasa teachers. The TSP is aimed to equip teachers with the tools, resources, and skills to enhance the learning experience for our students and inspire them 
to be, um, inspire them with the beautiful teachings of our faith. I'd like to show a, a short video that the team could please put up. Uh, <clears throat> while we're getting the video set up. Uh, this is a two-day training uh, that will happen on June 11th and 12th of this year from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. This is a high-value training and is offered free to our volunteers and includes lunch and snacks for both days. Um, there will be posters out there, as you've seen uh, earlier, um, and they will be posted on both the display boards on the gents and the ladies' side. Uh, the spots are limited, so we ask that all interested individuals uh, sign up uh, on the form uh, by April the 30th. Um, we hope that many of you will consider being part of the madrasa and will sign up for this unique opportunity. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free uh, to reach out to myself or any of the uh, uh, administration of the madrasa. Uh, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, please recite a loud salawat. Before we start the Madlis, if I can request the brothers on my left hand side to please stand up and move towards the right. Uh, we're expecting a lot of people, it's Friday, we also have the Etekaf program. If you can please come on my right and to the front. Thank you. Thank you. If we can uh, please welcome Sheikh Kelly with three of your loudest salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين به ونتوكل عليه والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلقه وخاتم أنبيائه وسيد رسله سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين السلام عليك سيدي ومولاي يا صاحب العصر والزمان هذا يوم الجمعة 
وهو يومك المتوقع فيه ظهورك والفرج للمؤمنين على يديك وقتل الكافرين بسيفك وأنا يا مولاي فيه ضيفك وجارك وأنت يا مولاي كريم مأمور بالضيافة والإجارة فأجرني وأضفني صلوات الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الوارثين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, the acceptance of the deeds, and for the hastening of the reappearance of Baqiyatullah al-A'zam, Ruhi wa Arwahu al-Alameen alahu al-Fida, enlighten your souls, purify your atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Respected elders, sisters and brothers, scholars, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Lady Nargis was the wife of Imam al-Askari and the mother of the awaited saviour al-Hujjat al-Muntadhar al-Mahdi salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhim ajma'een. A mother of the Ahl al-Bayt that is exceptionally well known and an individual that needs no introduction for you and I recognize that amongst the mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt that have had the honor to discuss briefly their lives this Ramadan, Lady Nargis indeed occupies a special position because many people have heard about her, many people know about her, and indeed there are some movies even produced regarding her. The recognition is that this lady was honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the womb that carried the awaited savior the individual who will bring justice and equity to the world just as this existence is filled with uh, uh, evil and injustice she was known by a number of other names Malika or Sosan or Sayqal she was amongst the mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt that was given names related to flowers because when you look at some of the mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt, their names are related to common flowers that used to exist at that time. Nargis is most likely to refer to the flower daffodil. And therefore, this is an indication of how the Ahl al-Bayt viewed their mothers, the latter mothers. They viewed them as flowers that truly blossomed, flowers that would produce and bring forth these wonderful individuals. This honorable lady, Nargis, is often referred to as the Roman princess. Many a times when you speak to people, they'll tell you that she was an individual from Rome, a princess that somehow arrived and was taken as a slave in Madinatul Munawwara, or rather in Samarra. The story of Nargis, however, has two different versions. A historical analysis is needed which requires your careful attention because without the attention you may come to a different interpretation to what is intended. The idea is a historian examines every aspect of a narration in order to come to a better idea regarding what is more accepted, what is more likely. The two versions about how Lady Nargis salamullahi alayha landed or arrived in Samarra have to be studied. The most popular one or one that many people are associating with and that is the one narrated by Shaykh al-Saduq. He was the first to narrate this. The first individual to present this story was Shaykh al-Saduq in his book Kamal al-Din wa Tamam al-Ni'ma otherwise also known as Ikmal al-Din wa Itmam al-Ni'ma this particular book is very important. Why? Because it narrates some of the story regarding the Holy Twelfth Imam. This story is as follows. Sheikh al-Saduq 
narrates from an in, a number of individuals, such as Abu al-Fadl al-Shaybani and others. He says there was a man by the name of Bishr ibn Sulaiman. Bishr ibn Sulaiman was a descendant of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. He was given a task by Imam Ali al-Hadi alayhi salam to go to a place where some of the slaves were being purchased. Imam al-Hadi would give him 220 dinars. He would give him a letter written in Roman, sealed, and would explain to him the features that he should be looking for in order to purchase a lady by the name of Narjus. So this man, Bishr, says, I went to Baghdad. I went to the marketplace where slaves are being sold. I looked for this lady and I found her. I found the features and I presented her with the letter. She cried and she said, by God, I have to be bought by this person. I will not go with anyone else, and I insist to be bought by this person. Bishr purchases her. Narration tells us that she was able to speak Arabic. She was able to converse in the Arabic language. When he purchased her, he would take her towards Samarra, where Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari were. He would ask her, what's your story? Why are you so special? Tell me a little bit more about you. She would say, I am 13 years of age. I am from Rome, and indeed, my forefathers are whom Shamoon, who is one of the disciples of Isa, and my father is Joshua, who is the son of Caesar, the Caesar of Rome. She says that my father wanted to marry me to my cousin, something which I did not wish to happen, and that particular event was all set up. I was supposed to marry my cousin, but indeed he fell, or he collapsed, or something did not take place. It did not go according to plan. She says, I saw in my dream the Prophet of Islam and Isa alayhi salam. They came to me and said to me, you will marry a son of the Prophet of Islam. The next day, she said, I saw a dream in which I was honored to meet the lady of light, Fatima, peace be upon her, in which she presented me with the religion of Islam. And therefore, I became a Muslim. The next day, I saw a third dream in which she said to me, you must go and pretend to be a nurse in the battle that is going on between the Romans and the Muslims and the Abbasid Caliphate. You pretend to be a nurse, you will be captured, brought to the slave market and purchased in Baghdad by so and so. And therefore, here I am. That's the story most of us are aware. Yes? regarding this lady called Narjis Salamullahi Alayha. There are a number of problems with this story. There are a number of issues with this story. And the role of the member is not to tell you what you like to hear. The role of member of Rasulullah and Aba Abdullah is to reform, is to bring what, what is out there in terms of studies, analysis, examination, yes? in order for you and I to be well informed about what exists out there regarding modern day research. What are the problems with the story of Narjis being a Roman princess? Number one, there is a severe problem with its senad, meaning the chain of narrations. There are two individuals who are the subject of the discussion here. One of them, his name is Abil Mufaddal al-Shaybani. Abil Mufaddal al-Shaybani, yes, he is an individual who scholars of Ilm al-Rijal, those who study the narrators and their authenticity, they've come forward and said, yes, he used to collect hadith, but the well-established scholars such as Shaykh al-Tusi, for example, Najashi, and Sayyid al-Khu'i, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, they all come forward and say, لَقَدْ ضَعَّفَهُ أَصْحَابُنَا that our people, meaning our scholars from the school of Ahl al-Bayt, have said that he is not reliable. He is not to be somebody who takes, who we take the narrations from. These are heavyweights of Ilm al-Rajal. Najashi, yes, Tusi and Khu'i. They are indeed heavyweights. They have said that this is not an individual to be relied upon in the narration of the Ahadith. Second, Another individual who is one of the narrators of this particular story, Muhammad ibn Bahr al-Shaybani, another Shaybani. The ulama of Rijal say he is one of the ghulat, 
one of those who exaggerated. And he was one of the mufawwaba. Mufawwaba are the ones who believed that, you know, at the end of the day, whatever happens is as a result of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forcing us. Yes, it is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it happen. Therefore, the recognition is these two individuals who are in the chain of narration of the story of Narjis being a Roman princess are considered unreliable. As a result, an individual studying this story will come to the conclusion that the riwayah is da'ifatu sanad and it is possibly mawdu'a, meaning placed and fabricated. This is important for you to recognize. That's the first problem with this particular uh, story. The second is you come and analyze history. Was there a conflict between Muslims and Romans at that time? There wasn't. After 242 after Hijrah, yes, because Imam alayhi salam, al-Askari alayhi salam would marry this lady after year 242, there was no indication of any wars between the Romans and the Muslims. So how did this lady come and disguised as a nurse in a particular battle? Historians did not mention any battle. There was no battle. If there was a battle, then we can say she came. But a part which is important of the story is that she says, I was part of the war that existed and I was a nurse. And therefore I was captured. How did she end up from Rome to Samarra or to Baghdad? Second. Third. This Abu al-Fadd al-Shaybani was a contemporary to Shaykh al-Kulayni, was a contemporary to historians such as Mas'udi, was a contemporary to Allama al-Qummi, he lived at the same time as them. None of them mentioned the story. None of them talked about Nargis being a Roman princess. If he was an individual who would narrate such a story, surely today we would have these scholars who would come forward and support what is found in Shaykh al-Saduq's work, Kamal al-Din wa Tamam al -Ni'mah. And therefore, as a result, some of the ulama have presented a question mark a big question mark regarding the story of Nargis being a Roman princess. Instead, you say, do we have an alternative? Today, I am sure the mass majority of the mu'mineen here and those watching would say that all my life I've heard Nargis was from Rome. She was a princess. She came and what? And she married Imam al-Askari. Is there an alternative to this or not? Yes, there is. There are reliable, sahih hadiths that give us a different story of Nargis. Please understand this. It's vital that you pay attention, despite being fasting and this being a deep historical subject. I would require your attention for the next few minutes so that you understand the subject and do not misunderstand me. These narrations are found in, for example, Kitab al Ghaiba al Shaykh al Tusi. It is said that. The holy 10th Imam, Imam Ali al-Hadi salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, brought forward a, and purchased a slave by the name of Nargis from the land of Noba, Nubia, modern day Sudan, and gave her to Hakima, the daughter of Imam al-Jawad. And said to her, Ya bint Rasulullah, khudiha ila manziliki wa allimiha. Oh, the daughter of Rasulullah, take this lady, Narjis, to your house and teach her. Allimiha al faraid wa sinan wa sunan, fa innaha zawja tu abi Muhammad wa ummul qa'im. She is going to be the wife of Abi Muhammad, which is the title given to Imam al Askari, and the mother of the awaited Savior. Teach her the religion. Now, we have a Sahih Hadith from Imam Muhammad al-Baqir salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. This Sahih Hadith means what? The chain of narrators are authenticated. Yes, this is found in Kitab al-Ghayba li Shaykh al-Nu'mani, page 228. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam says, according to the riwayah, inna sahiba hadha al-amri fihi shubhatun min Yusuf. The Imam who will come at the end of time, the Imam who is the 12th resembles Yusuf alayhi salam. Then he says, Ibn Amatin Sawda. He is the son of a slave who is dark in complexion. 
who possibly is black. يُصْلِحُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّهُ أَمْرُهُ فِي لَيْلَةٍ وَاحِدًا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one night would what? Bring forth the what? His particular hastening of his victory. Now, there are other narrations that support this notion, yes? We are told Al-Faith Al-Kashani in a book known as Nawadur Al-Akhbar narrates the following. Please understand the story from Lady Hakima. Lady Hakima says, كانت لي جارية يقال لها نرجس. I had a servant by the name of Narjis. فزارني ابن أخي أبو محمد that Imam Al-Askari alayhi salam visited me. He would visit his auntie Hakima. فأقبل يحدق النظر إليها Then he started to look at her فقلت يا سيدي لعلك هويتها I said to him, oh my master, maybe you want her as a wife فأرسلها إليك, I will give her to you قال لا يا عم, no my auntie لكني أتعجب منها No, I am bewildered, I am surprised إنا معاشر الأوصياء لسنا ننظر ريبة ولكن ننظر تعجبا He says, we the أهل البيت, we the representative of Allah, we do not look due to desire, we look due to being surprised. So now you should be asking, what was Imam al-Askari surprised about? Yes? He then says, فقلت وما أعجبك, what is so surprising about her? قال سيخرج منها ولد كريم على الله عز وجل الذي يملأ الأرض قسطا وعدلا كما ملئ الظلما وجورا He says from her a man shall be born who will fill the earth from Allah will fill the earth with justice and equity as it was filled with evil and injustice فقلت أرسلها إليك يا سيدي Do you want to take her? Yes He then says استأذني في ذلك أبي Go and seek permission from my father and so she said, I went and I entered the house of Abu al-Hasan. Who is Abu al-Hasan? Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. Yes, he entered, she entered the house of Abu Imam al-Hadi. فَسَلَّمْتُ وَجَلَسْتْ I said salam and I sat down. فَبَدَأَنِي He said to me, يَا حَكِيمَ إِبْعَثِي نَرْجِسْ إِلَىٰ إِبْنِي أَبِي مُحَمَّدْ Make sure Narjis is given to my son, Abi Muhammad, Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. قلت على هذا قصدتك على أن أستأذنك في ذلك I've come here to ask you about this حكيمة said I've come to take your permission so that I would give نرجس to أبي محمد الحسن إمام الهادي says يا مباركة إن الله تعالى أحب أن يشركك في الأجر الله wanted you to be part of the reward and that's why he gave you this responsibility and this notion of presenting this lady Narjis towards my son. And hence we find these two stories presented before us, isn't it? One that has a number of dubious aspects including weakness of narration and the other is supported with stronger narrations that indicate that lady Narjis was a lady from southern Egypt stroke Sudan, who was purchased as a slave, bought towards the Ahl al-Bayt, married by Imam al-Askari salam and gave birth to al-Imam al-Muntadhar, al-Mahdi, ajjal Allah ta'ala, farajahu al-Sharif. And that's why the story of the birth of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam is a story worth mentioning when discussing the biography of Narjis because no doubt Lady Narjis marries Imam al-Askari alayhi salam but the riwayat tell us that she was not necessarily fully aware of the fact that she is pregnant according to the riwayat although God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best the story is told once again by Lady Hakima salamullahi alayha look at the role that she plays in the story of Imam al-Mahdi and the birth of the Imam and the mother of the Imam at the same time the riwayah is told that Imam al-Askari alayhi salam on the eve of the 15th of Sha'ban year 255 it was a Thursday night says to her I want you to come and what? And have iftar with us. Because tomorrow, what? Inna Allah, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant me a son who will fill the earth with justice and equity. She was surprised. Hakima was also surprised. Why? Because the pregnancy of Lady Narjis was concealed. She was what? Not known to be pregnant to the world. And that's why Lady Hakima says, I came, I had iftar, and that night I began to speak to Narjis. She came to remove my shoes. I said to her, no, I have to serve you. Why? Inna Allah sayahabu laki fi laylatiki hadihi ghulaman sayyidan fi dunya wal akhirah. Tonight, you're going to give birth to a baby who is the master in this world and akhirah. She, Hakima, said, all of a sudden, I saw that Narjis fakhajilat was tahiyat. She became embarrassed. Yes? Thereafter, she said, I monitored her throughout the night. I was reciting Quran. I recited Surah Sajda and Surah Yaseen throughout the night until it was close to Fajr, but I did not see any signs. So I began to question my heart. Is it really going to be a birth here? When I began to question, I heard whom? I heard Abu Muhammad al-Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam. He says, لا تعجلي يا عم فهاك الأمر قد قرب The command of Allah is getting closer. I went to her, I helped her, she said she gave birth, but I could not see what happened. I saw a ghulam that was pure, that was clean. I picked him up, I heard him recite, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lah, wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh, wa ashhadu anna amir al-mu'mineen Ali. And he mentioned all the imams until he stopped after his father, Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. And I took him because what? Because my, uh, whom, my nephew, Imam al-Askari, said to me, what? Bring him to me. Bring him to me. He picked him up. And of course, he was seen in the state of what? Prostration. And therefore, it was a time of happiness and celebration for the next few days. She said, on the seventh day, I saw him repeat the same thing. But this time he recited the beautiful verse, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is the will, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to ensure that those who were oppressed on this earth will be the inheritors of this earth. Yes, and will be the ones who will lead. And that's why this story was one that was kept between Hakima, Lady Narjis, and whom? And a few of the close disciples of Imam al Askari alayhi salam. But you know what Imam al Askari alayhi salam did? He celebrated as well because the riwayah is told that he told Uthman ibn Sa'id, you should know Uthman ibn Sa'id, one of the four representatives of Imam al Mahdi alayhi salam. Notice that he was present at the birth of Imam al Mahdi and Imam alayhi salam then makes him one of his representatives. He said to him, Ishtari asharata ala fi ratli khubuz. Buy 10,000 pieces of bread and 10,000 pieces of meat and distribute this in honor of the birth of the awaited Savior. May Allah hasten his reappearance. The important here question that some of you may ask is, why do some scholars believe that the story of the Roman princess being Narjis has been fabricated? Why? What is the philosophy or the reason behind it? It's been suggested, and Allah knows best, that there was attempts in order to somehow reinforce the connection between the 12th Imam and Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Because Nabi Isa, according to Sahih Riwayat in Sunni and Shia literature, will pray behind Imam al-Mahdi, no doubt, yes? And so some wanted to bring this realization and link it to the mother of Imam al-Mahdi. That is one suggestion. Another suggestion is that some disliked the notion, the suggestion that it is possible that the mother of Imam al-Mahdi was dark. Was what? Was perhaps Samra or maybe black, yes? And therefore, they did not wish to suggest that the 12th Imam might be of that complexion too. Therefore, this narration, perhaps, and Allah knows best, because we are just presenting the evidence, and it's up to you to decide, in order to come to the conclusion of whether which version of this story should be accepted and which version shouldn't. Yes? 
When we study the life of Narjis, what do we find? We find that she did not live long after the birth of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. Why? In the first five years, we are told that perhaps after four years, Imam alayhi salam was taken by Lady Hudayth, the mother of Imam al-Askari, towards Mecca. And Lady Narjis was kept from the eyes of Bani al-Abbas because it was incredible persecution of the Shia at that time. Bani al-Abbas wanted to find who the mother of the 12th would be. After the martyrdom of Imam al-Askari, she went through a lot of hardship. The house was attacked a number of times. She was then arrested. Who was arrested? Narjis, salamullahi alayha, according to riwayat. She was placed in the dungeons, in prison, because they believed she is the mother of the 12th. And in order to save herself, and most importantly to save her son, what did she say? She told them, I am pregnant. They said, very well, we'll keep you until you give birth. They kept her for two years in the prison. They kept Narjis, salamullahi alayha, two years, and they saw that she was not giving birth. Neither was there any signs of the pregnancy until she eventually, she was released because there were problems with the Bani Abbas. They had problems in Basra. There was a rebellion in Basra, and therefore she was released. She did not live long after she was released, and we don't know exactly here that she left this world. However, she endured so much suffering and difficulties. Here, very briefly, two important points to learn from the story of this honorable lady, Lady Narjus Salamullahi Alayha, and what an honor to remember the mother of the master of our time. May Allah hasten his appearance and make us of those who serve him, who remember him. Important point number one is what? Is that when you see the illustrious life of Narjus, of whom? Of Hudayth, of Sosan, of Khayzuran, of Najma, yes, of Hamida, of Umm Farwa, of Fatima bint al Hassan, of Shahrabanu, of Fatima, yes, uh, uh, Umm Farwa, and these glorious, illustrious mothers of the Ahl al Bayt, there's an important realization that emerges that we must learn today. And that is what? Allah Jalla wa Ala has created males and females differently. Meaning what? There is pressure today in society to somehow come to the conclusion that whatever the male does, the female has to do, and whatever the female does, the male has to do. There is a blurring of gender roles. Yes? In the notion that there is the Me Too movement, the feminist movement, there are those who are calling, yes, for rights. As we discussed yesterday, there is a role for the empowerment of our ladies, without shadow of a doubt. There is a role to reform some of the practices that exist. However, at the same time, one needs to mention also the impact of some movements upon our sisters and brothers in the idea that they come forward and now they want Islam to conform to some of these ideologies. Let me give you an example. In Islamic law, in marriage, we are told that the husband must provide for the wife as far as maintenance is concerned. Do you agree? They have to provide one of the hukuk that the wife has. They have to provide food, accommodation, and clothing. This is wajib upon the husband. And as much as this is wajib, what do we find today is sometimes some of our sisters, when they see this, despite being able to support their husbands, they don't do so because they say that is what Islam says you have to provide. When the husband is struggling due to COVID, due to pandemic, finding it very hard to make ends meet, yes, it's wajib upon him to do so, but who says not helping him is what something Islam encourages. In fact, Islam encourages the support. Yes? Similarly, what do we find? We find in some occasions when it comes to looking after the children, some of our ladies say, why should I be nurturing and educating and looking after the children staying at home? Why shouldn't my husband take this role? Because today there is a blurring of this. Yes, there are some aspects that's good in this discussion, but there are also some aspects which are problematic. In other words, today we have to speak truthfully. Yesterday we said the ladies need empowerment. Today we say sometimes there is extremism in this. Extremism in this way. Which way? In the notion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created females with the power of emotion, with the power of love, that they have more than their husbands, in which they are able to nurture and look after children in a better position than their males can. 
Some will say, no, no, no. We don't agree with this. Where did you bring this from? How can you bring scientific evidence? The males and the females can do the same thing. This blurring of gender roles is a problem. We're not saying that, for example, we should stick to what culture has presented. No, sometimes there is a discussion to be made. It's neither this way or that way. We denounce any form of extremist. Look at this as a reaction of the suppression of women's rights. We do not either support what people going out to the extreme and seeking to somehow, what? Seeking to somehow impose some ideas upon the religion of Islam. And that's why you see these honorable ladies knew their roles in society. They understood what they can and what they can't do, what they ought to be doing and what they're not supposed to be doing. That's number one. Number two, the discussion regarding racial prejudice. Yes, the Holy Prophet of Islam, Rasul al-A'zam wa Nabi al-Akram Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In a narration, listen to this. He says, "Man kana fi qalbihi habba min khardal min asabiya, baathahu Allahu yom al qiyamati ma Arab al jahiliya." The Prophet of Islam warns and denounces racism as the religion did from day one, without a shadow of a doubt. If you look at the actions of the Imma, you look at the stance of the Prophet when he has, for example, the likes of Bilal and Salman al Muhammadi, Rudwan Allahi Taala alay. They are stances against any form of prejudice and bias, systemic bias that existed at that time. The Prophet of Islam says, if you have an ounce of racism in your heart, Allah will raise you on the day of Qiyamah with the Arab pagans. With those who are disbelievers, isn't it? Why? Because لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ دَعَى إِلَى الْعَصَبِيَّةِ The riwayat of the Ahlul Bayt says, any one of us who calls towards racism is not one of us. Yes? Is not subscribing to us. The question is, is there racism in the Muslim community? Anybody who says no is naive. We have to reform ourselves. We have to look at our practices. Sometimes, how does it come? It comes subtly. For example, jokes, remarks about certain groups. We laugh about them. We share them. We post them. Remarks about certain people of certain denominations that exist today, yes? We say, oh, you're doing this because you're a this, for instance without mentioning it from the member, yes? We have to be careful. Even joking, we should not have racially what derogatory remarks. At the same time, what do we find? We find that there is a form of racism that exists when it comes to talking about certain other people. When we start to distinguish, when we say me and them, when we say their color is this, or their background is this, right? And likewise, when we look at our literature, we have to be also vigilant. We have to be also careful, not necessarily every wire that I find, which seemingly has racial tendencies or what, attacking a certain group, immediately I jump on the bandwagon and I start to use it. There are contextualization of riwayat. We have to be very careful. This conversation is of the utmost importance because the Quran, no doubt, comes forward and says, Inna akramakum, inna Allahi atqaakum. And that's why Lady Narjis, salamullahi alayha, her stance, the stance of the mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt before her highlights how the Ahl al-Bayt wanted to incorporate these individuals within society, to normalize having relations with people of different color, different denomination, different background. We do not have any indication from the Ahl al-Bayt that somehow they look down upon these people. They said, well, for example, these people should be treated in any different way. Rather, the Ahl al-Bayt empowered them. The Ahl al-Bayt gave them responsibilities, gave them tasks, and duties in order to honor them, in order to make sure that people recognized that this kind of practice whereby people are, ba are, are judged according to their color is unacceptable. And she was indeed buried next to the holy lady Hakima and the two imams in Samarla, salamullahi alayhim ajma'een. With regards to the spiritual tip as we are remembering the holy 12th imam and his blessed mother, a very important tip that our maraja practice, something which is highly encouraged for you and I to do if we can, every day in Salatul Fajr, when we finish, to recite Ruk'atayn Salah and gift the Salah to the master of our time, Imam Al-Mahdi Ajrallahu Ta'ala Faraj. Yes, in order for us to keep that connection, because when you keep a connection with the Imam of our time, it means you're remembering him. It means you're thinking of him. It means you're praying for him. One of the best ways to keep a connection is to do a deed and give the thawab to him. 
Some say, does he need it? You have misunderstood how these things work. The moment you gift this to the Imam, and of course he is on a high ascension, he is above us in the rank, but similarly like the Salawat, it keeps raising his status. But the more you remember him, the more he remembers you. The more you remember him, yes, the more you connect with him and you recognize that what? When we ask Allah, Allahumma arrifni. What? Hujjatak fa illam tu arrifni. Hujjatak valaltu an deeni. I must have this cognizance of my, the Imam of my time. He should be present in my life every day. Do we remember Imam al-Mahdi every day? Is this something that we often refer to? If not, then let's do a rak'atain salah or give some sadaqah or something in his honor every day if we can. That's a spiritual tip. And finally, the fiqhi reminder. And that is a common mistake in wudu that some of the mu'mineen often practice when it comes to wudu. Sometimes when it comes to performing their wudu, what do they do? For example, when they come to take the water, they do this. And then they, what? Wash the face like this. According to our maraja, our ulama, Sayyid al-Sistani, Sayyid al-Khu'i, rahmatullah alayhi, other maraja, this wudu is batil. Why? It's intikasi, meaning what? When you start here and then you go up, this invalidates the wudu. You must start the wudu from the top of the face and go down. You cannot start here and then go up. If you, for example, came and did this, started here, then you realized, oh, I was awake just before iftar on that Friday and I realized that shouldn't happen. What do you do? Don't panic. Just step one second and start again the wudu, this time from the top. But if your intention is that your wudu starts here straight away like this and then you carry on, that is where the problem lies in wudu. May Allah ta'ala accept your deeds, your a'mal, raise us with Lady Narjis and all the mothers of Ahl al-Bayt, allow us to learn from their lives, allow us to understand, for example, their principles, as well as, of course, that of their sons, the holy, glorious, ma'sumin, the Ahl al-Bayt of Ali Muhammad, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'een. إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين من صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن عليا ولي الله أشهد أن عليان عمير المؤمنين حجة الله 